Welcome everybody on behalf of the Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I am an educator at the museum. And this afternoon, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Ava Perlman, a Holocaust survivor from France who will share her story with you. And afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Before we begin, I'd like to share a quick history of our museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure the world would always remember and learn from this tragic history. And they did this at a time when most people were not yet willing um, to talk about the Holocaust, but thanks to their courage and foresight, we had the first and oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States, always with the mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. We can't do the work that we do today without our survivor community, who still on a regular basis shares their stories with us so that we can remember their history and learn from it. I'm honored to welcome and introduce Ava Perlman today, who will be sharing her story and who speaks on a regular basis and works frequently with our students. And we're so happy to have Ava in our community. Ava, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. I'm very honored to speak again uh, for you here. Uh, and I will share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, before I forget, I would like to dedicate this story to many people who, who helped us during the war and with whom we would have had difficulty surviving. I don't say that they helped us survive uh, because they didn't risk their lives to hide us, but they kept us alive and helped us a lot anyway. Um, these are the five people whom I will mention later, Placero, Megos, Bravo, Montanex, and Giron. I was born, and my mother was born in this little village, uh, Driesen, in Germany, and now it is in Poland, but it used to be in Germany. She grew up there. Her, her father, Adolf Levine, was a um, jeweler and silversmith, goldsmith, and he had a very nice shop there. These are my grandparents on the threshold of their shop. This is their family my maternal grandparents, my mother on the left, and her brother two years younger, Alfred on the right. My mother is Charlotte and Alfred. These are my maternal grandparents. My mother grew up in that little village and very early she uh, already um, uh, experienced anti-Semitism, uh, especially in high school. She had uh, Nazi teachers who had, um, um, what you call it, the, the Hitler sign um, on, on their lapel, inside their jacket. Anyway, um, she grew up and she wanted to be a doctor. That is, was the mission and the dream of her life to become a doctor because her mother fell very sick when my mother was five years old and she wanted to be a doctor at all costs. So when she finished high school, she went to Berlin and stayed where she lived with her grandfather on the other side um, because she didn't have much money. And she started her medical studies in 1928 or 29. Uh, and she met my father in 1930. These, these Charlotte and Rodolphe, this is their uh, engagement picture. And my, my uncle, two years younger, this is his, he and his wife, also at that time, they were young married, and they decided to go to Palestine. Anyway, uh, I was born in May of 1932, 
yeah, my parents, they were, ma they were married in August of 1931, and I promptly showed up in May of 1932, eight months before Hitler came to power. Um, so it became very quickly obvious to my parents that Jews were not welcome anymore in Germany, could no longer work, uh, many more restrictions happened. And my father was lucky enough to have a, he was a patent attorney and he had a colleague in Paris who invited him to come over to Paris if things became difficult in Germany. And so my father had the wisdom I'm sorry. My father had the wisdom to and the opportunity to take this up and he already was in France by August of 1933. He already went to Paris, leaving my mother and me still in Berlin. My mother was still a student going to school and my paternal grandparents were taking care of me during the day. This is the building in which my father had his office in Berlin and then he, we went to Paris. Uh, in October or November, 1933, my mother and I followed him to Paris. Now let's see first what happened. Uh, in October of 33, my mother got this letter uh, from the president of the university, Friedrich Wilhelm University. Uh, you are hereby excluded from further studies at the University of Berlin because of your Marxist activities. So my mother had to pack up and leave. She was not politically inclined at all. She only joined a socio-democratic group on campus to be able to go to the library for free so that she could study because she didn't have money to buy the books. In the meantime, her younger brother had taken up a, an apprenticeship in a large agricultural complex. And his boss received this letter on 17th of November uh, that said, after our last meeting in mid-October, I directed you to dismiss your apprentice, the 21-year-old Jew, in a few weeks. I have been informed that you have not done so. <clears throat> it is unacceptable that today a Jew should still be employed in agriculture, while our German brothers suffer from need and hunger and are unable to find employment with their own kind. You are hereby ordered to dismiss this Jew or else I will leave to take further action. I will have to take further action. Signed, Walter Heil Hitler. So my uncle had to pack up and they went very shortly after that to Palestine. Now, the two next pictures are not very good pictures, but uh, they are very old and they show you what Palestine looked like before it became Israel many years later. There was nothing there, and this was the mode of transportation that people used to carry their luggage. And my uncle and aunt went to Kibbutz Kvarsold in the north of Palestine and helped uh, um, build up the kibbutz. Uh, in the meantime, we uh, lived uh, first uh, very close to Paris in the closest suburbs in a large apartment building, which housed many uh, Jewish German, German Jews who had taken off uh, and escaped Germany like we did. And then in 1935, my mother had a little brother for me the day before my third birthday. Ernest, <clears throat> and then my parents decided we, we have to go and live in a bigger place and they rented in a villa in Le Vésinet, which was a little bit further from Paris, but not much, just a 20 minute train, train ride from Le Vésinet to the center of Paris. Um, so we lived there. Uh, oh, and my mother then uh, became um, pregnant again in 38. And everybody said to her, are you crazy to bring another child into the world? The war is about to start. These are very unsettling times. Uh, how can you, how will you manage with three children? And my mother, my parents said, well, I'm sorry. I mean, we have two children. We'll be happy. We'll, we'll do our best to save ourselves with three. 
what can we say? So um, my mother then uh, uh, expected that baby for the mid-April 1939. In uh, the beginning of 39, my father sent tickets to his in-laws, my maternal grandparents, who were about to leave uh, Germany. Uh, they had moved to Berlin as a shop because nobody in their little village would go to the Jew anymore to buy any jewelry, except maybe a few gold wedding rings by young men uh, who wanted to marry their sweethearts just before leaving for war. Uh, and the, so, and in Berlin, they ended up, my grandfather ended up buying a lot of silver and jewelry from Jews who wanted to leave the country and who wanted the money for their stuff. They didn't want to take all their, their silver with them. So he bought a lot of silver. Anyway, my father sent them two tickets. This is my grandmother, Elsa Levine, to uh, board the, the Trinton ship fr uh, from Marseille to China uh, on the 9th of March, 1939. And these, these tickets were to allow them to leave Germany and they were to go to, Fran to, to Marseille directly to go board their ship. So they wrote to my mother in about February or March, um, we are sending two trunks to you with old clothes that we cannot take with us. Please keep them when you receive them uh, in case we get together uh, later, another time. So by the end of March, my mother was eight and a half months pregnant with a huge baby. She was very big. And she got this letter from the Paris station railway station, we have two trunks for you to pass customs for and please come and pick them up. So my mother took the train and went to the main station in Paris and the, the official there, the French official was very nasty. She was speaking with a bit of a German accent in French and he said, oh, you foreigners, we don't need you here. Why don't you go back where you came from and open your trunks, open this trunk. And my mother got so enraged that he would behave that way uh, that, uh, and she got so red in the face. So finally he was just scared that he would, she would have the baby right there and then. And he said, just, just, oh, okay, just go. And she never opened the trunks. When she, get home, when she came home, she opened them. And sure enough, there were well, lots of clothes on the top. But underneath that was all the jewelry and silver candlesticks and, and plates and things, whatever, uh, that my grandfather tried to save from his shop. <laughs> so had she known what was in those trunks, she would never have become so genuinely angry and gotten away with the trunks without having to open them. So sometimes it pays to be ignorant. So this was one of the first miracles that happened to us. My, my, our lives have been full of miracles and uh, we were saved by miracles several times. So this was some bit of the jewelry that, uh, and silver that was in the trunks. I mean, no, no jewelry is showing here, but a lot of silver, which is now still in my family. So thank goodness for my mother being so heavily pregnant. So what happened to my grandparents? My parents were without news from them for a long time and did not know if they had left Germany, if they had boarded the, the Twinton ship. And finally they got news that they came, they arrived in Marseille and instead of boarding the Twinton ship to Shanghai, they boarded a, a little illegal boat to Palestine, like the Exodus. Well, actually the Exodus was much larger. This was a small boat. And they were for six weeks on the Mediterranean. They went to Palestine. They were chased by the British. You can't come in here. Uh, then they went to Cyprus and stayed there for a while, for a few days and then tried again. So uh, their life, life on the ship was miserable. They lacked food and water. They had to give uh, everything they possessed down to their wedding rings just to get a half a potato and a glass of water. 
But finally they made it, thank God. And my uncle was there to welcome his parents uh, on the shore of Palestine. And they, they lived then in Palestine, which became Israel and lived the rest of their lives there. Um, in, so uh, my, my paternal, so these were my maternal grandparents, now they are in Palestine. My paternal grandparents who took care of me while I was a baby, um, the, they came to, they left Germany in August of 1939. Uh, I don't remember how they managed to get out, but they came to live with us in Le Vizinet. And this is a picture of my grandparents with the three of us. I'm holding the baby Raymond and this uh, Ernest on, on the right of the children. So in 1935, I'm seven, Ernest is four, and the baby is just four, three months old, four months old. <clears throat> so... My father worked in Paris with Monsieur Placereau, for Monsieur Placereau, to whom we owe a great deal. And in 1940, uh, the Germans started to invade France from the north. So it became dangerous to stay in Paris, especially for my father, who looked more Jewish than the rest of us. And Monsieur Placereau said, why don't you go somewhere south and take with you some of the archives of our office, which have to do with national security, and we want to uh, make sure they do not fall into German hands. So my father left and went to, um, from Le Vésinet to this area there near Issoudun. Issoudun is a bigger place, but we were in a very small a place close to Issoudun, where my father rented an old castle and he hired an old lady to take care of me and my brother Ernest. My mother stayed with the baby and her in-laws in Le Vésinet for now. So we lived in Massé and we had many bombings, uh, many sirens all the time. And so we immediately uh, ran into the basement. And one day when we came up from the basement after the bombings had fallen and sh shaken the place, we found that a big piece of the bomb had come through the glass roof of the veranda under which my father had his desk and armchair. And that piece of bomb had gone straight, not only through the roof, but through his chair. And had he stayed at his desk, he would have been killed. So just, I'm forever grateful. Um, so uh, in Issoudun also, I was taken suddenly with acute appendicitis and had to be operated in on uh, within a few hours. The surgeon afterwards told my father that I was lucky to make it, that another 24 hours I would have died because it would have burst and we didn't have antibiotics yet, yet in those days. <clears throat> so Issoudun now, or Marseille, became closer to the Germans. The Germans were coming down again, further down, and we went to Lyon, where my father rented again uh, an apartment in the uh, suburbs of Lyon. And I want you to look before I leave this, this area where Grenoble is and the area in the mountains here. Uh, this is a mountainous plateau. Um, where we end up, um, southwest of Grenoble. So, the, the, so my father and, and my brother and I were in Lyon, and France by now was divided into two sides. The, the, pink, the pink top was the occupied zone, and the blue ones was the, the free zone. And you see that Lyon is still in the free zone. And my mother then came down with the baby and my grandmother. My grandfather had died in, in January of 41 when we were in Marseille. And my mother was not even able to tell her husband that his father had died uh, because there were no communications uh, in, in, they were all controlled by the Nazis. 
So my mother arrived at the demarcation line, the blue line that you see here on her way to Lyon. And again, another official was very nasty, a French one again, and said, well, you and the baby, you can go. The old, the old woman stays behind. And my mother said, oh, no, I can't leave her here. Uh, uh, we are in danger here. And uh, so, so you force us to stay with her here in the, in the occupied zone. If anything happens to us, it will be in your, on your conscience. And she made such a fuss and got so red in the face again that he finally had enough. And he said, OK, OK, just go. And so that's how they uh, passed the, the demarcation line and came to join us in Lyon, in the, in the Caluire, the suburb of Lyon. <clears throat> By now it's 41, and we lived there for a year until 1942. And in 1942, this is the, the Gutmann children. Um, I am now 10, Ernest is seven, and Raymond is four, uh, three, sorry, he's three. And my mother said in 42 to my father, you know, we have to do something to, to shelter the children somewhere. We cannot we cannot stay here or leave them here. So she went to that area that I showed you southwest of Grenoble in that plateau area, which was speckled with homes for children, like boarding homes for children, where before the war, the French people used to leave their children in the summer for two weeks or a month so that they could take a vacation by themselves and know that their children were well taken care of in a place 3,000 feet above sea level, nice climate, they were well fed, they were well taken care of. And so there were many of those homes there. And my mother went to each and every one of them. They were all packed and full to capacity. And, uh, and in her desperation, she just tried still the last one, which was two miles from the center of the village called Clairefontaine. And she arrived there and Madame Montonix was very kind and said, I will take your children. So my mother saw a crucifix on the wall and she said, I see that you are a devout Christian, but I hope you are not going to try and um, uh, convert my children. And Madame Montonix assured her that she wouldn't. And this is a picture here of Madame Montanex. I'm standing next to her. And Ernest is here in the front on the right. I don't know, Raymond is not there. Um, he's probably napping or something. I, I don't know where he is. Anyway, so we lived in Clairefontaine for about 10 months, during which time my mother came to see us twice or three times for just for the weekend. And the last time she came to visit us, she received an urgent message from my father Stay up there, I'm coming, I'm joining you. He had decided it was time for him also to hide, to disappear. <clears throat> the Montanex, by the way, risked their lives by taking the three Jewish children in, and they are inscribed as righteous Gentiles at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. Now, I, the, the other people whom I always thank and I'm so grateful for didn't absolutely risk their lives. That's why we could not get them inscribed at Yad Vashem, but they are righteous Gentiles all the same. So my father rented the upstairs of this house here in the middle called the Yellow House because it was yellow all this time. We rented the upstairs and there was only one entrance down here to the upstairs and our landlord and landlady lived downstairs. This is our family in 1942 when we started living in Autran all together because my parents then took us from Clairefontaine and we lived with them in the yellow house. And these are our landlord and landlady, Mr. and Mrs. Raveau and their two daughters. Colette was my age and Georgette was already 20 years old. And they risked their lives also. If the Nazis had found out that we were Jews in their house, uh, they would have been done for just along with us. So my mother had to set up shop 
suddenly and she had only brought a little weekend pack with her and she missed a lot of stuff in the kitchen even though it was kind of furnished she missed a lot of things so she said i have to go back to lyon and it was dangerous lyon was already full of germans but she says I, i'll be careful so she took the train the bus from Autran down to Grenoble, the train from Grenoble to Lyon. And imagine that the, the station was here on the other side of this bridge over the Rhone. She, um, she ran over this, this bridge and picked up a tramway that took her along the Rhone all the way about a 20 minute ride to a place where she had to get off and run the, up the hill to where we lived, where our, where our place was. So she did that, she came into our, our apartment, they, she packed up a, a few things and she was having tea with our landlady when she suddenly looked at her watch and said, oh my God, I can't miss my train. She said, a happy, she said a quick goodbye and thank you and ran down the hill with her heavy equipment and boarded the, the tramway. By chance, by heavenly chance, the tramway that went every 20 minutes was about to leave. She jumped on it, on it and it came back along the Rhone River. She ran around, uh, across that pedestrian and traffic bridge. She barely made it onto the platform when the guy was already, had whistled already or was whistling. And she picked up the train. And as the train slowly started on its own railway bridge, the other way from the way she had run across one way and the bridge, the, the train was going in the, the reverse direction, slowly over the Rhone River. And she was still out of breath and taking off her hat and looking out the window. And she saw that this bridge she had just run across four minutes earlier had been cordoned off by the Germans and they were asking for papers. Now, my mother would never have made it out of there because she was still Charlotte Gutmann, born in Dresden, Germany, and, and carrying this whole package of stuff. She would have been taken for a resistance and she, she would have been picked up. So by a matter of minutes, several times we escaped like that. I thank God every day. This is a view of Autran in the winter to show you how beautiful a valley it is. The, the mountains are not very high and there, is a lot, there are a lot of forests and trees to which we could run if need be. So how did we manage to live in Autran? My father took his bicycle, he had a bicycle and three times a week he would go to all the farmers in the area uh, um, buying uh, um, um, a glass of milk here, two eggs here, um, using his cigarette tickets and his alcohol tickets and some money, which Monsieur Placero provided because he, um, he helped my father to work part-time in Autran uh, and uh, so that my father was paid also part-time and had money to, to buy food for us. Uh, and to buy to pay rent, we paid rent. Um, <clears throat> uh, once a week, my father would go down to Grenoble by bus uh, and meet a, the, the secretary of the, the office in Lyon, Madame Megos. They would meet briefly. She would bring him new files to work on and he would hand her the files that he had worked on for the past week so that he continued to work like this. And of course he did everything by hand. He didn't even have a typewriter in those days. Um, so anyway, Monsieur Placero allowed us this way to survive uh, with enough money so we could buy food. My father found a cave in the mountains where he hid some hard, hard boiled eggs and some drinking water and some money just in case we all had to disappear in the, in the forest. Um, we always had those alerts, you know, the Germans are coming up the hill, the Germans are coming. How did we get the, these alerts from through the post offices? Nobody here in Autran had a, had a phone, except maybe the, the, the city hall. So <clears throat> the first post office down uh, in the plain 
when they saw the Nazis try to come up the, the mountain, um, alerted the next post office and the next post office alerted the third one and et cetera, et cetera. And from each post office, two people would immediately run one to the baker, one to the hotel. And from the baker and the hotel, two people would run to two more people and et cetera, et cetera. And so within five minutes, everybody uh, was um, alerted who had to take off. Uh, and we had many of those false alerts. It was very difficult for the Nazis to come up the mountain because the roads were very windy and very narrow for their big equipment. And they, they had uh, tr trouble coming up. Um, I was able to go to school for a year uh, in a boys school there, which took in a few girls because of the circumstances. And um, my mother wanted new uh, identity cards for her and my father. So she went to the city hall and said, we need new cards, please, with different names. And the clerk said, well, uh, I will give you new cards when these become illegible. So she went home and the cards accidentally fell into the wash. And the next day they were dry and illegible. And my mother was able to get new cards with different last names for my father and her and born in France or in Belgium somewhere. I don't remember where, but um, she got different cards. So anyway, we, we lived there. Uh, oh, and my father also found three farmers who were uh, willing each to take one of us children in case the Germans came up to Autran uh, when we had an alert again. Um, and they would be willing to say, this is my nephew or my niece from Lyon. They didn't have enough to eat in the city. So we took him in for her. So we lived like this. Uh, uh, so and so, as, as we say in French, uh, until the, the, oh, and then the, 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 the beautiful Americans came to Normandy, June 6, 1944. And we were so, happy that we, and we thought, hopefully the Americans will help us to push the Germans back and finish this terrible war. My, mom, my parents never heard of the Holocaust, what was happening in, in Poland, in Germany, and in Hungary, and all those. Um, we, we listened to the BBC. My father had a, a small radio. It was forbidden to have a radio. So he had one and he listened to it under a pillow and all we could get was the BBC from England and there was never any talk about what was happening in, in Europe, in Middle Europe. <coughs> so uh, on the 14th of July, we were all happy to celebrate Bastille Day. <coughs> and we went on a picnic to the top of a mountain at the end of the valley. And while we were eating, we heard planes coming and my, I remember my father saying, I hope these are American planes. And we followed them with our eyes, they came above us and then we looked down and they, they bombed our valley. So obviously they were German planes, not American ones. We ran down the hill and my father swore to himself that if he had to die, he would die with a weapon in his hand. And the next morning he and his two male friends uh, who were also living in Autran, uh, went and enlisted into the French underground army, the Résistance army that was um, stationed actually very close by because Le Vercors, where we, we were in, this big plateau that we were on, was very difficult of access uh, to, to accede. And that is why the Résistance had its headquarters there. So the men left and left the women and children to fend for themselves. And then the Germans really came. And we didn't even have an alert, I think. They just came. And we, the next morning, my, mo my mother heard our landlord call her from downstairs and he said, Madame, can you please come and help me? What happened was, two Nazis were standing in the entrance and they didn't know French. Our landlord didn't know German. What did they want? My, my mother was supposed to do the interpreting and she did it 
uh, speaking a very, very bad German, like pigeon, pigeon German, just lining a few words together and with a French accent, not making grammatical sentences at all. What, she, what they wanted was a bedroom in the house to sleep because they would have their meals with the landlord and landlady and they would sleep somewhere in the house. So the landlord said to my mother, why don't you give your bedroom uh, you, since your husband is away? So I'll give you a, a cot that you can take to the attic and you can go sleep in the attic. I mean, he had no choice and my mother had no choice. So my mother spent two weeks in the attic at the window at night, not sleeping because she had not heard from my father and she didn't know if he was still alive or what. She was afraid that maybe during the night he would try to come home and uh, knock on, or no, throw a pebble against the bedroom door uh, window upstairs to alert her to come downstairs to unlock the door for him. And so she spent two weeks at the window of the attic while two Nazis slept next to the three Jewish children. I mean, go figure. The orderly came into our kitchen to, be, to bake a chocolate cake for, my, for, for his boss and he never gave a crumb to the three children. We, start, we stayed pretty invisible uh, when, the, when we knew the, the Germans were in the house, but they usually were in the house only at night to sleep uh, or to eat downstairs, but they were busy the rest of the day uh, for two weeks uh, looking for Jews and other people whom they wanted to send to Auschwitz. So, um, so finally they left. And they left in such a hurry, thank God again, thank God, because they usually, when they left the place where they stayed, they would kill the inhabitants and burn the house down wherever they stayed. And thank God they, were, they left in such a hurry that was mid-August 44, that they didn't have time to do anything, they just took off. So we continue living in, ah, so the, the bicycle story is the main story of my, of my story, but I don't have time for it here. It takes 40 minutes just by itself. Uh, it's another um, miracle in my mother's life. She had a bicycle accident on her way down the road to, towards Grenoble, which kept her from flying into German lines downstairs, uh, down below, German armies. If she had ha not had that accident, she would have been caught and she would never have come back. And the whole story, by the way, is in the book that I've read, Eva's Uncommon Life Guided by Miracles. Uh, this is the only story of the war that my mother was ever willing uh, to write about. She could not bring herself to write her memoirs. It was too painful to relive all of this. Uh, so in, in the fall of 44, we went back to Lyon. Lyon uh, was already liberated again, the Italians and the French. Now the Italians were, were um, fighting with the French against the Germans and were pushing the Germans back up north and we could go back to Lyon. Um, and I have to leave a few things uh, because there's no time. This is my family after the war. Uh, I must be maybe, uh, well, I was 12 at the end of the war. So maybe I'm 14 there and my brother Ernest is 11 and the little guy is seven and my mother and me there. Um, then um, I lived in, I, I lived the rest of my life until my marriage in Paris. I went to school normally. Um, and uh, became a nurse to go to live in Israel because I came out of the war with a huge inferiority complex. I was Jewish for one thing in a, in a fairly anti-Semitic country. And I spoke French with a slight German accent because I only spoke German until I was five at home. And I learned French when I started going to school. So, I had this slight German accent and we just came out of a war against Germany. 
So I felt like a second class citizen. And in, when I was 18, when I graduated from high school, my parents sent me to live in Israel for a year. I met my relatives, my uncle and aunt and my cousins whom I didn't know, and my grandparents who remember, you, you remember they went to Palestine in 1939. So I spent a year there, I learned Hebrew, and the following year we went back for my young brother's bar mitzvah and I decided I wanted to live in Israel because I felt at home there. I felt that there I didn't have to feel uh, ashamed or embarrassed of my past, of my my, the source of my, okay, my, um, my grandparents, whatever. So I was told become a nurse. So I became a pediatric nurse and I met my husband who came through Paris for three days. It was a miracle in itself. It was love at first sight. We were married in five weeks. It was just absolutely amazing. And then it took us on a trek through England, where Oxford, where he did his graduate work, to Uganda, where he did field work towards his PhD in social anthropology. And then he got a, a job in Berkeley. So, oh, this is our wedding, our civil wedding. Our civil wedding was in France, and our religious wedding was going to be two months later in, in Kansas City, where all of my father, my, my husband's family. Uh, was living. And my parents had had tickets for 10 months already uh, on a trip, uh, on a ship to go to the US for the first time for their 25th wedding anniversary. So they were going to be there anyway. So we made it possible for Mel's family to be, my husband's family, to be there at our religious wedding. <clears throat> my husband. Um, um, very um, unfortunately passed away in 1988. He was 55 when he died of leukemia in Canada. And we went to Canada after Berkeley. And I came to Los Angeles in, in 1989. And I've lived here since. Now, my life took a turn for the better uh, I made a life for myself here, but when I discovered the March of the Living, it changed my life. This is a, uh, an annual trip for, for Jewish 18-year-olds uh, just before they graduate from high school. We go to Poland for a, a week and then to Israel for a week. In Poland, we visit concentration camps and old synagogues and old Jewish cemeteries. And we learn about life in Poland before the war and we learn about the Holocaust. And we march out of Auschwitz. That's the March of the Living on Holocaust Day. We march to Birkenau. Uh, this is my eldest daughter here and her husband with me in Auschwitz in 2012. They came on the adult march, which goes parallel to the students march with which I went. <clears throat> now, in Auschwitz, I, when I saw this map, uh, it, it, it is really a very moving and tremendous museum in Auschwitz of the Holocaust. And this is a map that I saw on the wall. Uh, these are the railways from up or all the way up to 1500 miles, all the way to, to Auschwitz with all the cattle cars, bringing the Jews and others to Auschwitz, all the people they, the Nazis wanted to exterminate. And there's Lyon. And we were so close to Lyon. Had we been caught, the first thing we would have been, we would have been on a, on a um, cattle car to Auschwitz. Uh, I, I couldn't believe this map when I first saw it. So yeah, I, you remember Claire Fontaine, the home where we were, the three children without our parents for 10 months in 1941 to 42. I had a love affair going. I was 10 with the son of Madame Montonex, who was 11. Where all we did was keep uh, guard the, the cows together in the meadow. And 70 years later, my granddaughter and my daughter found him living in the south of France with his wife. And we arranged in 2012 to go see him. 
and, and, and his wife. He was already very sick with lung cancer. And I'm so happy that we went to see him. Can you imagine seeing him after 70 years? And we were never uh, in correspondence all those years. And he gave me a hug like you wouldn't believe. And it was so touching. I was really touched. Um, yeah, and we also went back to Autran. He gave us the phone number of the daughter of our former landlord and landlady who is still living in the yellow house and the house is still yellow, except that now they have made a roundabout in front of the house, which wasn't there. And these, you remember our landlord, the landlord and landlady's two daughters, here they are 70 years later with me. And I asked them, weren't you afraid when the Germans were sleeping upstairs and eating their meals with you? And they said, no, no, of course we weren't because we already had two Nazis in the house so nobody would come and bother us. <laughs> that was news to me. Anyway, it was so much fun to see them again. And we were like old friends, even though we hadn't spoken for 70 years because we went through the same troubling times together. Um, my life changed again when I, I met two German ladies, non-Jewish, who work for Jewish causes. Both of them felt, feel the responsibility and the guilt for what their fathers and grandfathers did. And uh, that really helped me to put away my hatred of everything German that I grew up uh, until my 80s. And unfortunately, even my children inherited that hatred of every, everything German until uh, I went to Germany and they, they went to Germany after that. This lady invited me to come to Germany. And I went again for the first time after 80 years, I, I was 18 months old when I left Germany and I was in 82 or 83 when I went back. This lady is volunteering to put these plaques in the sidewalks called stumbling stones uh, in front of every house from which Jews were taken to their death. Uh, they, they go through, the, 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 through the, the archives and they find all these people who were taken straight from their homes or their shops and they put plaques in the wall and they are very small so they, that you have to either kneel or bend to read what it says on them where, when they were born and where and where they died and where. This is my second granddaughter with my friend Sigrun from Germany who invited me to Germany. She showed me the university where my mother was a student and the building where my father worked. And they even took me to Driesen where my mother was born and, and raised. And this is what it looks now. You can see the courthouse is still there. And even that funny shaped house there is here. My grandfather had a shop here somewhere but we couldn't find any place. This was the railway station from which my mother took the train for two hours each way to go to high school. And these are the two ladies, those two German ladies uh, who have reconciled me more or less with present Germans, not with the Nazis of 80 years ago. And one of them uh, belongs to the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. And with that um, embassy, they came to Auschwitz and I met Rose, in Auschwitz. They came to support the Jews and ex experience the March of the Living. And we, we are still in correspondence. I am with both of them and so is my family. Um, and then uh, I was blessed with three children uh, and they are here, the three of them. And this is my son and my eldest daughter with her husband and their da her daughters and their sons-in-law and my second daughter with her two children and her husband and my six grandchildren a few years ago. And I, my mother of blessed memory, she died in 2001 of Alzheimer's. And I, at the time I made this PowerPoint, we, I had three great grandchildren, two in Jerusalem 
and one in Boston. And now I have a fourth one in Toronto, born two months ago, and I'm expecting two more uh, before the end of the year. So I hope to end the end of the year with six great grandchildren. And this is a picture of my book. And I want to thank everybody for your patience and for listening. And I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. If anybody has questions, those watching on Zoom can use the Q&A box and those watching on Facebook can use the comment section and we'll answer as many as possible. First question is, can you please share with us at what point you told your own children about these experiences um, and what it was like to be married to an American who didn't have these experiences? Um, I, I think I told all, all their lives, they, they, they grew up with hearing about how we lived during the war and how lucky we were to escape. Um, I don't really remember when I started telling them. They knew all the time. Um, over 20 years ago, I started uh, writing my story in a class for seniors, uh, and I wrote just stories, which eventually became a book, and which they read as well. And my grandchildren also were aware. And I remember my eldest granddaughter who made Aliyah. She went to live in Israel many years ago, several years ago, and she got married there and now is expecting her third child in Jerusalem. She asked me, she got her friends together and she asked me to tell them my story. And she did that several times actually. So my grand, also my grandchildren are very aware of my story, but I, I've, I've lived with it all my life. The only thing that is interesting is that I never met a survivor until I went to the March of the Living. So, and I started in 2011, so I had no idea what was happening here, the Holocaust Museum and the Museum of Tolerance and, and, and survivors telling their story. I had no idea that this was happening. And I started telling my story with the March of the Living. And now what it was like to be with uh, my husband in America, well, it was a new experience after living in France and then in England and I lived in Israel and I lived in Uganda. It was just another experience. And I remember one of the things that, that uh, um, impacted me most was the supermarkets where you could buy three cans of pineapple juice for a dollar and the colorful cars, the, the parking lots looked like a candy, a candy box, a box full of candy of different colors. Um, and the, the size of Kansas City, the, 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 the width of the streets and the beauty of the homes where everybody lived. I mean, I was just taken with everything. But I, I just, I fortunately adapt very easily wherever I live. So um, I loved it all. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I had no difficulty adapting. Thank you for sharing. Can you please tell us a little bit about your parents and what their lives were like afterwards? Well, my parents stayed in Paris and, and my brothers. Um, and uh, my, my father continued working. He became, after the war, he became an associate of Monsieur Placereau and, and two other men uh, in, the, in the firm. And he worked until the day before he passed away of a massive heart attack in 1974. My mother lived until 2001. She died at 90. And I am 90 now, so I knew I had probably until 90 because I looked like her, but I'm still here at 90. So, uh, but they continued their regular life. Uh, my brother also, my, my uh, Ernest became a chemical engineer and started working for the, also for the Placero and Gutmann uh, office. And my younger brother became a pediatrician and um, allergy specialist. Um, and uh, both are now still living in Paris uh, in fairly good health. Uh, one is 87 and one is 83. 
and I hope to go see them soon because they won't travel anymore. Thank you. You mentioned that you were in Berkeley. Um, when were you there? The 60s, 1963, 1963 to 1970. We went through the, the unrest of the, uh, civil, the civil unrest at the universities and um, um, ah, missed the word now. The schools were integration in the schools, mixing the black and the white children, which was very difficult at that time. My, my daughter who was nearing 13 uh, before we left uh, was afraid to go to school, to high school. There was always a fire in a garbage can or a girl uh, standing in line and somebody passed by her and snipped off one of her braids or things like that. They, when when people young people in puberty years are stuck together and different uh, black and white um it didn't work very well i remember my little my my younger daughter when she was in kindergarten she had no eye for color at all and she had a little friend whom she talked about all the time and to just situate her i asked her is she black or white and my daughter says I don't know. It didn't. So that told me how important it is to mix black and white when they are little kids and they become friends and they never think of, of different races, of being of a different race. Thank you so much for sharing that. Did your child, what was the relationship like with your children and your parents, their grandparents? Uh, my relationship with my children is good. No, the the so your your oh, children and and your parents. So your, how did your children get along with your parents? Very well, very well. Actually, I I grew up uh, when they grew up. I forced them to speak French with me. I would not understand if they spoke English, and it took a while. They didn't like that, but it, it took a while for them to understand how important it was that they knew French. Because when we went to France and they could understand everybody, even though my whole family could speak English, uh, they also spoke a lot of French. And my children could understand everybody and make themselves understood even without having to speak English. And there they finally thanked me for having forced them to speak, to, to learn French. So they got on very well with their aunts and their grandparents and their cousins. Thank you. And I'm I'm sure it was special for your parents to get to have a relationship with grandchildren as well, even though they lived in a different continent. When they were able to see them, I'm sure it was special actually, for them. Actually, when my, my father turned 70 in 1972, he sent us five tickets to fly to France to be with him in, in honor of his birthday. And when we arrived, he handed my husband and me two tickets to, to go to Italy and, and the money uh, to go to Italy for, for uh, 10 days. Um, and they said, we take the children, we take care of them, you, you go to Italy. They knew it was my dream because when I met my husband, he was going to go on a tour of Europe with friends of his that he was going to meet in, in Paris. And because we met and got married, he missed that trip. And I had been to Italy many times with my parents on uh, during the summer. Um, we went to Switzerland and, and to Italy many years. And I wanted so badly to go with my husband to Italy. So we did. And my parents took care of the three kids and the three kids had a good time with their grandparents. Thank you for sharing that. Um, here's a question from me. Where did you get your sense of humor? Uh, from my grandfather, my, my paternal grandfather. Remember my grandparents when they came to join us in Le Vésinet in the August of 1939? He brought me two books of fairy tales and he told me jokes, Jewish jokes. 
and he was quite a joker. He, he was a very serious man. He was a, had a PhD. He was he had he was a director of some Jewish schools and very uh, an important personality in in the Jewish uh, community of his day. But uh, he joked a lot, and this is from whom that I got my sense of humor. And only one of my grandsons has inherited that same sense of humor and, and desire to tell jokes about things. <laughs> Can you share with us how you use this on the March of the Living? The joking? Yes. Uh, well, at night, uh, during the day, uh, during the March of the Living, the days may be pretty gloomy, uh, especially when we are in Auschwitz and et cetera, et cetera. And in the evening, we had to have fun. So <clears throat> I told jokes. And I've been actually amassing. <clears throat> I have a huge a folder of, of jokes that I printed when I received them by email or what. So I was thinking if I ever write another book, it would just edit, I would edit a book of jokes that I have, um, that I have not written, but just copy them and put them together in a book. It would be fun. <laughs> but I, I, I tell jokes to two people here at the Jewish home where I live, and those two people love my jokes. And one of them said to me, Eva, you are my vitamin for the day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I can vouch for that. I know that we're, we're so grateful to have you in our community for many reasons, but your sense of humor is definitely one of them. <laughs> to conclude, can you please share with us what you would like your audience to take away from learning your story? You speak on such a regular basis, um, a lot of times to young students, What's important for you for the future generations to learn from this story? The first thing I think of is be, be grateful. Be grateful for living in a good country. Be grateful for your family, for the food on the table, for being able to go to school, being able to go to university, being able to take up opportunities. So many, a million and a half young Jewish children lost their lives in the Holocaust. And we don't know how many of those would have become great philosophers or doctors or lawyers or artists or musicians. Uh, so be grateful. Secondly, do not forget the Holocaust. Go on the March of the Living if you can. Uh, there, there are lots of trips for adults as well. They are very educational and they, they change people's lives. They have changed my life. They change those students' lives. Um, learn about the Holocaust. Uh, the one week in Poland is worth more than a whole year on a university bench learning about the Holocaust from books or from movies. Um, and transmit it to the next generation. Education is the only thing that we can help, uh, we can hope will help uh, with the anti-Semitism that we are now experiencing that is growing. So keep getting yourself educated and educate the next generation. And be positive, be positive, laugh. Find the silver lining of something bad that happens to you because we can't avoid those things. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, not just today, but every time that you share this story and this message to students, our future generations, because you make a big impact on their lives and on their outlook by sharing this story. Thank you so much. We are so grateful to have you as a part of our community. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. We hope to see everybody next week. Uh, next Thursday, Martha Sternbach, survivor from Hungary, will be sharing her story. So we hope to see you then. In the meantime, Ava, again, thank you so much. And we just wish you all the best. And we look forward to seeing you soon and hearing you speak again soon. Thank, thank you so you, much, Michael. everybody. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you.